Now we continue. And I do have some interesting converting to gift friendly trivias to add to this trivia video. So chapter seven. If you look closely at the March Hare illustration, he has a sort of straw hat that was a sort of common way to depict madness in the Victorian era, which is where and when this book is from. And in public TV, but for now, some trivia. The Marsh Hare's hat is a sort of straw. Because in Victorian times, a hundred years or so ago, it was a common way to depict madness or craziness. This book was written a century ago. And the reason that time was called Victorian was because of the queen called Victoria. Now, did you know that Lewis Carroll's uncle was an inspector for insane asylums? Yeah. I know. Robert Wilfred Skeffington Ludwig, who also liked photography apparently, was a commissioner and inspector for lunacy. Now, before you get too horrified with a Victorian insane asylum in your mind, for this man's credit, he seemed to have tried some nice sounding healing methods for the patients. From hot baths, with dinner while bathing, to gardening and knitting to quadrille dancing and tea parties, which is very amusing to see the characters try on these and other chapters. Again, I'm keeping it kid friendly, so I won't go into more details than this. I just wanted to add what would have been a mad tea party for John Lewis Carroll. In chapter eight, the trivia was, a cat might look at a king is a proverb supposed to mean that everyone has rights, regardless of who they are. And while I don't think it is known where this phrase comes from, we know it was at least as far back as John Haywood, 1497 to 1580, who served in Henry VIII's time. And in the other version, a cat might look at a king is an old English proverb that roughly means that everyone, even cats, have rights. This phrase is as old as John Haywood, who was born in 1497, more than 500 years ago. But even this book we are reading is more than 100 years old. Did you know one of Carl's father's allies was a man named Henry Lydell, who, while he helped Carl in many ways, the one most telling was when Carl, already a mathematics teacher, in the religious part of Oxford, requested to not be made a priest, which would be against the rules at that time for him to not be one. Mr. Lydell decided to allow him this exception for some unknown reason. Still, Carol won many math awards, maybe that helped convince him. In chapter nine, the Griffon is one of the most important symbols of Oxford University and a symbol of at least one of the debate teams. I have said before that Lewis Carroll was a professor at Oxford, so it makes sense for him. But even kids from back then might have parents trying to get them to have tutors from there so as to get closer to getting accepted there in the future. While I could also say about why the mock turtle looks the way it does, I might leave that for later. Later still. And in the other version, the Baltic TV one, Griffons are one of the most important symbols at Oxford School, which is where Lewis Carroll taught, which I told about as a trivia in Let's Read. In this book's time, it was normal for even young girls like Alice to know about a school and even to have teachers from there teach them ahead of what they would learn normally as tutors. Still, Lewis Carroll did seem to find it a bit silly, in my opinion. So, another bit of trivia about Oxford and the Cheshire Puss. I have also read that Mr. Puss, as a religious authority, was also called a patristic catenary, as a catenary has to do with chains, like chain of command in this case. And also, mathematically, it can mean the curve of a chain, as it's a bit limp it might look like a grin to someone 
very versed in pun making. That's why I find the King of Hearts so funny, because he's the only one that admits it. In chapter 10, as you can guess, this is the voice of the sluggard, or just the sluggard, is from Isaac Watts. Again, it's a very religious rhyme about how you shouldn't be a sluggard. As always, I prefer the Alice version. Still, kids at school back then were very forced to learn and recite the Watts version. I don't think that's good, but this book seems to agree with me on many things. The Public TV version. This is the voice of the sluggard, or just the sluggard. It's a rhyme poem from Isaac Watts. Again, it's about not being lazy and reading a lot. While I do like to read, I much prefer Alice's version of the rhyme poem. Still, on this book's time, a kid like Alice will need to learn to recite most poems like Watts, something I later argue this book finds annoying. For extra trivia, more about Mr. Lydell and about his family. I recall reading somewhere that Carl seems to have been a tutor to Henry's oldest son, and that is why he met one of Mr. Lydell's daughters, Alice Lydell. It was quite normal to have college professors teach even young children, so as to, che I mean, help them enter into the school the rich parents want them to get into. But speaking of that Alice, she also had an older sister called Lorena, like the Lori from chapter 3. And Carol had a friend called Robinson Duckworth. I'm serious. In chapter 11, the description reads, Last time I asked about, why are they writing in slates, rather than on paper, or something like that? The literal answer is that, that was how it was done in the Victorian era. You had a much different pencil, and had to write on the slate. Sometimes, you had to basically carve it. Sometimes, it was like chalk. Instead of an eraser, the elegant solution was a sort of sponge tied to the bottom of the writing slate. It was even used in school, which is why Alice knows about it. Paper for writing in schools is a much newer idea. While I answer my own question from last time, I do think it is quite important for the book to understand how similar school life was to this trial. And on the public TV version, I said that last time I asked about why are they writing on slates. So, the reason was that, that is how they did it back then. A century ago, they used slates for writing, and the sponges for erasing, instead of paper, even in classrooms, especially in classrooms. Actually, not only is that the reason Alice knows about it, but this whole trial reminds me, and Alice, too much of school. For the extra trivia, going back to Carl's family, did you know that his youngest brother, Edwin Dodgson, was a very devout preacher? He had a whole adventure on the island of Tristan de Cunha, 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 which was one of the most remote islands on the planet, island of Tristan. Still, let's just summarize and say he had problems there. He couldn't really keep staying there and eventually had to go back to England. And I remember reading somewhere that he had help from his elder brother to finish helping the island and going to an easier job. His older brother was said to be constantly exasperated by Edwin's dedication to preach. I think they're cute. Lastly, in chapter 12, the trivia was, in both versions, that this book is in the public domain. Anyone can read it. For the extra trivia, I'll say that he has other books, but a lot of them are for studying and learning. For example, there's a story of Queen Victoria, who became a big fan of the book, asking for his next book, and then they brought her a book of advanced algebra Carol wrote. This is just a story. I do not know if it's true, but it is kind of funny. But now, we can move on 
to my little sort of essay idea. To explain what I think Alice in Wonderland is truly about and against what. We'll then head into my second favorite book to let's read. But for now, we'll continue. And during my essay video, I'll talk about Dinah because I believe he's very important to understand. Thanks for listening.